Welcome back everyone to Uptime Community. This is part two of the three-part series with Joe Jordan. Religion. It might affect their credibility by bringing up religion. You know what that is when you don't tell people everything? That's called what? Cover up? Cover. <laughs> Did I say anything about the government here? No. But everywhere in the UFO community, they want to blame the, co the, the government for cover-up. I just shared with you probably the biggest cover-up in ufology. It's amongst the researchers themselves that the UFO community is relying on for the truth. From their own researchers, not the government. It's backwards. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it is. So I told them, I said, guys, I appreciate your help. I said, I I work for a living. I don't live off my research. I said, I got nothing to lose here. I said, I see this as a missing piece of the UFO puzzle. I said, I'm going to take this piece. I'm going to own it. You're telling me there's more cases out there that I can document. I'm going to look for those cases. I'm going to document them and I'm going to present these cases. And this piece will now go to the table. And they all said the same thing. Please do, because we can't. In 25 years of research into this, they've never come against me in my research. Others that have come up in the years um, in abductions have been very vocal, almost violent against me in the research because they weren't the ones that I talked to. Um, they are really, this is probably the most hated piece of research in the UFO community that I have. Um, because since that first case, over 20 years now, I've worked with over 600 cases. I have about 150 documented cases on my website. In the book, Piercing the Cosmic Veil, um, there's over 60 in the book. I'm still sitting on another 70 to 80 that are going to be split up in the next two books. And they're still coming in every week. So my question has always been through the years for people that doubt that this works and doubt that it works in this way is how many testimonies do you need to see because they're never going to stop give me a number they're never going to stop coming in the more i share this the more new people see this the more new people get exposed that this is even being recorded and documented and the more people send me their testimonies now, this is initially what CE4 Research started out to do. But as we got up to maybe 30, 40 testimonies way back when and, and posted them, things took a turn that was totally unexpected. We had people that were reading these testimonies, experiencers, and they, they would look at us these they would look at these testimonies and go i wonder if they can help me so the next thing you know i'm getting contacted and going i'm an experiencer i read these testimonies of these people being able to put their experiences behind them no longer having them can you help me and i'm going uh <laughs> That wasn't where I thought this was headed, but I think with what we have here and you look at it and I help you with any answers you need to your questions, I think if you follow what's being shown here, I think it should work for you too. And once we laid this all out, lo and behold, it works for them too. What's that called? 
Amazing. That's uh, well, besides amazing, <laughs> it's called repeatability. Yeah. That is what blows the community away because science requires repeatability. Nobody's called a UFO in a second time. There's nothing in ufology that is repeatable except this. I have people that have been able to stop the experience by calling out in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. They've been able to terminate the experience as a life pattern through a relationship with Jesus Christ. I've had people now come to me and say, can you help me by showing them how these other people change their life and them doing what they did, their lives changed. That's repeatability. That is what's got the community so upset because no other name works. Krishna doesn't work. Buddha doesn't work. Muhammad doesn't work. Nothing else works. You get stories of, like Ann Druff, the late Ann Druffel's book, Stopping Alien Abduction, that came out back in, where was that? Late 90s? In her book, she listed calling on a higher personage to stop it as one of the ways. I mean, there were other ways that people said that they'd stop an experience. Um, that was one of them. But the difference was is a relationship with Jesus Christ terminates it from your life because the abduction experience is an ongoing event in your life unless you can shut it down completely it continues unexpectedly you don't know when it happens that's what we've been able to do for people we've been able to show them that this personal relationship with jesus christ creator of the universe can shut it down completely okay they can't do that that's the difference and that's something I had the opportunity in 2004 to share the um, conference with a, a number of speakers. And one of them was Ann Druffel. Um, Guy Malone had invited her to the conference and to speak on, you know, during the conference on her book hmm. and uh, purposely so we could talk. And um, it was amazing that. Uh, be able to catch up with her and talk about all of that. But it was then that uh, I talked to our other partner of Alien Resistance at the time. Alien Resistance was uh, three people coming together, three ministries coming together. It was Guy Malone of CQ1, myself of CE4, and uh, Pastor Chris Ward of Logos Christian Fellowship out of Leesburg, Florida. Pastor yes, Ward. Who have I uh, been able to meet? Uh, one of his spiritual warfare conferences, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's recently passed away too. So he was there, and I talked to him, and I said, are we in trouble? And he goes, no, this is about terminology. You know, she says stopping the experience. I said, so what are you saying? He says, you're showing they can terminate it. Ah, so that's the difference. He goes, yeah. He says, you're, you're showing they can terminate it from their life. So that's that's the difference between the relationship with Jesus and just stopping it once. Something we also found is uh, an answer to the secular realm's other question. Um, why does this happen to some people? Working with all these case histories over the years, we did a, we are able to answer that question. One... Some in it's not just one answer. It ended up being three answers 
And it's either one answer or a combination of any of the three. One, people ask for it. And you go, no way. People actually ask to be abducted by aliens? Yes. Um, I was at the point in my life that uh, I was so tired of chasing my tail that I was, I used to visit a, another UFO group up in Edgewater, Florida. I used to take 95 from where I lived up to go up to Edgewater. I used to come back on the way home at night, back down to Titus, Titusville, down 95. I'd be looking out the window with the stars coming down 95, yelling out the window, take me, show me something, you know. And you got to be careful what you ask for, mm -hmm. you know. You really do. Because... Mm -hmm. There's somebody listening, and they will they will answer that question for you. That mm -hmm. happens to some people. The second one, which is the most frequent, I think most frequent. I'm not sure. I'm kind of kind of leaning to three here lately. I'm I don't know if I'll ever get that answer, but more and more three is popping up. But number two is people that have unknowingly opened the door. This is all about open doors, giving permission. They unknowingly open the door to allow these entities to, to do this. You're giving them right to do it. And that's done by dabbling in anything that God says, don't mess with that the occult, the paranormal, necromancy, any of these things, ufology, Ephesians any of these things. Huh? Ephesians 5.11 have nothing to yeah. do. They have nothing to do. But people unknowingly open that door. You know, people playing with lottery tickets, people that get, you know, and I got to tell you that the, the enemy, this is not just the one door we're talking about. Um, we're talking about ufology right now. But the enemy has so many doors to deceive us and and, and get us lost in. Um, alcohol is a door. Drugs is a door. You know, anger is a door. Pornography is a door. Gambling is a door. Everything is a door. You know, everything there, all those things are things that we unknowingly step into, you know, and there's, and there's only one way to get out of it. The same way that I'm telling you to get out of this. It's all the same. So you unknowingly open that door and allow these experiences to come in. Okay. Usually, the doors I'm talking about, the paranormal, the new age, the, the metaphysical realm, those are all connected to this UFO realm. So those eventually will get you involved with abductions. The other one, the one that I seem to, to be leaning a lot toward very heavily, is the more investigations I do, because I'm usually talking to an adult. I try to take them back to where their experiences began. Where do you remember them starting? Wow, man, I tell you. If you if, if you talk to them and really take them back, they, they remember them starting as a child. Well, you know what? That can't be number one or number two. That has to come from someplace else. Well, it took me a long time to figure that one out and a lot of praying to God to show me in Scripture. Show me where this is coming from. He did. But it took a while to figure that one out, you know. And Scripture talks about the man being the father figure, being the spiritual head of the household. And that gives a spiritual covering over the family. If that father is not doing his job and keeping the spiritual covering over his family, not only is he open to the wiles of the enemy, 
The sower is children and his wife. Mm -hmm. So I went back going, huh, if this is true, I should see some evidence of this. So I went back, started re-interviewing these experiencers. I don't want to know about your test, your, your history of the abduction. I already know about all that. I want to ask you some other questions. Tell me what you remember as a child. Tell me about your family life. Tell me what you know about your mom and dad. This is a tough one because now they're giving away their parents. And I have to be very careful how to do that because, you know, they always think that they're the ones that did this you know, themselves. And I have to let them realize that, it, you know, I can't just say your parents did this. I have to let the Holy Spirit tell them that do that, that, that this is where this came from. So as I start laying this out, they make the connection. The Holy Spirit makes the connection for them that, wait a minute. When you talk about number two, they were doing number two. Mm -hmm. And then they realized the open doors were coming from the parents. That's why the attacks were on the children. But scripture also tells that we have the ability to break that cycle. You know, people talk about alcoholics coming from alcoholic families, you know, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. that it's a genetic disorder. It's that it's a social disorder. This is the same thing. You grow up in a family that's that's open doors to ungodly things. It's going to continue, you know, until you break that cycle. Right. And how do you break that cycle? Through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Breaking the chains. Yep. So... That's my research. That's what we do. We continue to do this, putting it all together to where not just I'm the only guy that does this has been the challenge. Um, I've had people work with me come and go over the years. I always call it CE4 Research Group. It's I don't want it to be about me. It's not me. It's the testimonies. That's That's the evidence. And it's always been a group. It's never been just me working on it alone. I, I want people to know that it, there's always people helping. But it's never been a, a fixed group. People come and go as they, you know, the, as they want to help. People have busy lives. I've been given this as my mission in life. But, you know, it's not everybody's mission, you know. But it's a mission for people for a time. Um, I've had many great people I've just been blessed to work with over the years that will come for a couple of years, some just for months, and just help get some fantastic work done, you know, and then they got to go back to their own lives, you know, and I'm just glad that God sent them to help out, you know, and I've got some right now that uh, are just, I, I, yeah. I couldn't have chose these people. I didn't choose these people. Scott sent them into my life right now. And I'm seeing a team being built right now that is just like, it's got to be for a, something going on or coming up that is just something I can't even imagine. Because these guys, these guys and gals that are God's bringing into me to the group right now have abilities and wisdom that I have never seen um, and testimonies. Oh my, I, you know, I've worked with 20 years of testimonies, but these, they're just amazing and powerful and, and just Christ focused in a way that it's just, it, it's just, it, it's shaking me to the core to hear these testimonies, you know? Um, He's got something big coming up. I don't know. You know, it's 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 just so much more than what I've dealt with in 20 years. So I'm just excited to see all this come about. You know, we've got a show like this that we're doing, um, the Piercing the Cosmic Veil show. We named it after the book. Yes. You good. and I worked together, you know, 
what more than 10 years ago doing radio interviews with the testimonies yeah yeah, yeah. back in 07 we we were doing uh curse net breakthrough radio with byron lebeau and uh yeah you know you brought we kind of made a whole segment just for uh the testimonials that you had yeah uh, on the show i mean it was um you know we called it uh your joe jordan testimonies it was just like you know we had to come up with something and yeah. you know uh, and and it was you know, I, we brought on a number of people, and uh, one of those people, uh, of course, was um, uh, the woman by the name of uh, Joyce Ahrens. I couldn't remember her name for a second. Uh, Joyce Ahrens, uh, yep. which you dedicated the book to, uh, you know, yep. uh, to to her, and um, she had an amazing testimony uh, of that um, just always kind of brought her to a very emotional state. Yeah. Uh, and you can you could see why uh, it was very real to her. And any time she brought it up, I think it just it kind of just brought her back to that moment. And just the power of the name of Jesus, of Yeshua, this just the power of the name, just just eliminating this stuff out of her life was is is incredible and i mean we had so many you had so many testimony at the time you said i think over 500 and that has since grown oh yeah uh, and, and it's and further evidence of this repeatability that you just spoke of the scientific word of repeatability that really makes it the unwanted piece of the ufo puzzle yeah and back then, when when uh, when you guys were recording them, that was that we thought that was the high tech that we could get them in audio, where you could actually hear their voice, compared to just a written testimony in a Word doc, you know, on the yeah. website. Well, now right. with our new show, that we're actually bringing them on face to face. Now you get to see them, you know, and and all the the responses we're getting, are just amazing, not just from the from the you know the people that are watching the shows. Uh, it, it's breaking us down to do the shows, you know. Uh, you know, we, we're sitting there bawling at the end of the show, listening to these testimonies. We can't hold it together, you know, doing the shows with them. It's just phenomenal. So, you know, that's that's just been something that I have just looked forward to for the longest time, and now it's here, you know. And and it's not just been a group that's been local to work with. I mean, how can I even do local? I'm in Korea. You know, I'm the only one here doing this. You know, there's no sightings here. There's no nothing here. These people aren't into this phenomenon at all. Well, that's you know? another interesting aspect of the book and what you brought up yeah. in regards to the the evidence of physical craft, right? Um, what is actually being seen here and why is it so prominent on in the Western culture as opposed to where you are right now in South Korea? Could you bring that up a little bit and, and discuss why that is? Yeah, um, I've been here 10 years now. And when I came over here, I thought, wow, you know, God's got a plan for me, obviously. I was working at the Kennedy Space Center before I came over here. Um, I went from the boat company to the Kennedy Space Center, um, which was the Space Center, I had watched everything for 40 years from across the river. Um, that was my lifelong dream to work at the Space Center. God finally opened the door and blessed me with my dream. Um, that's a whole nother story, but it, it, I could I could bring tears to your eyes with sharing my dream with you. It, it still brings tears to my eyes just to think about it, what, what, he, what he gave me to experience there. There were people there that worked 30 years that worked in an office that never saw anything but their office on the Space Center. He blessed me with a job that I covered every inch of it. And I got to photograph it and keep the memories. And it's just like, wow, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, how many people can say they, you know, <laughs> they yeah. can they've done that. <laughs> so, and then, you know, always wanted to go back and travel again. I told you in the beginning, you know, I've been to 15 countries growing up. Now I've been to 18, you know, I've been over, got to come back overseas again. And uh, I love being overseas. 
you know, it, it's such a, a different experience, but it's what I grew up with, you know, and uh, I've since, since I've been over here, I've been to Japan, I've been to Taiwan and, you know, racked up two more, you know, and uh, but when I came over here, I thought, well, God's got a plan with this ministry and I get over here and there's nothing. And I, I, I'm asking my Korean friends, they all speak English, all Koreans do everything they can to learn English because um, they're trying to take over the technological world, you know, which <laughs> if you're an American, you kind of know that. Uh, Hyundai, Kia, they're everywhere in America. Um, just about every cell phone is uh, Korean, you know, appliances, Samsung, LG, you know, come on, you guys are all buying Korean products. Right. They're taking over in technology, you know, and I'm watching them do it right here. And you guys are buying all their stuff. So mm -hmm. they all want to learn English because to compete, you got to know the business language and that's English. So they're all learning it in schools. They all want to talk English to American people to better their speaking it to correctly, you know, um, so I talked to him. I said, hey, what do you think about this UFO stuff? Uh, we don't have time for that. So I'm like, what kind of answer is that? You know, and I asked somebody else. I don't have time for that. You know, and after about a third or fourth time of getting that same answer, I'm like, that makes no sense of an answer to me. Must be a, you know, a, a cultural problem here in the, in the language. So... I got a co-partner I'm working with, um, my friend, Mr. So, love him to death. Been my friend 10 years now here. And he happens to be very well in English. And uh, he happens to be, a, uh, has a degree in American literature. So, and he's my, you know, close to my age. So I asked him, I said, Mr. So, help me out here. I asked these people, you know, what they think about this subject, what they know about this subject. And they, they give me this strange answer. Oh, yeah. What does that mean? He goes, they don't have any time for this. And explain. And he did. Sixty. These people are 65 years out of a total devastating war. This country was leveled, okay? I mean leveled. My dad was in this war. He was a ground pounder here in this war, combat infantry. He's still alive today to talk about it. He saw this place. There weren't any trees on the hills here. This place has a lot of hills. They were barren. They burned out everything, okay? This country had to rebuild from nothing. And they did it and became the top technological country in the world. Or damn there, in that amount of time. It's amazing what you see here. The generations that you see all together, okay? You still got people in the older generation that were probably high school or so during the war. Okay, their families were farmers. Well, that's all they knew growing up. So they're still farmers. They're still in the rice paddy in their 80s, okay? That generation is still stuck doing the same thing. But the next generation came along. They got educated, okay? The major churches came in. They were the ones that rebuilt this country. The missionaries came in. They built churches. They built hospitals. They built schools, okay? They started the process process going. Businesses came in, started infrastructure and everything else. But the education process pretty much came from the churches. So that generation started getting an education, started getting some manual employment because they were the ones that built the infrastructure of the country. So they're working class, but also educated. Okay. Mm -hmm. They also got Christianity, come out of Buddhism and the Christianity. The older ones are still a lot of Buddhism. 
um, the next generation, younger generation, kind of 50-50 Christianity, they're highly exposed to more education and more materialism, okay? And then you've got the brand new generation, which is materialism. So you got like four different distinct generations all living at the same time, okay? But they're all focused on what? Success. Mm. That's the drive. So you're either working in the field full time, all the time, sun up, sun down. You're either working a regular job to support yourself and support your next generation kids to go to college, right? So you're full time. You don't have time for anything else. Or you're the next generation. You're working for a big company to support your next generation kids to go to college. Or you own a company, which you work all the time to run. Same thing. So you're busy all the time. Or you're a student that has to succeed to be world class, not top in Korea. They are after the world. So these kids, unlike Americans that would rather skip class, mostly that I saw, was these kids, you see them coming home from school at 9 and 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, really. All day and into the night. Because they want to be the best of the best of the world. They're taking extracurricular sports, extracurricular music, extracurricular um, tutoring for language, whatever it takes. They, you know, these parents will pay for it. They will work themselves to death to pay for it. So when they say, I got no time for that, you're absolutely right. Now, I've done 20 trips to Japan for my job over the years. I got time I've spent over there. I got friends over there that I built rapport with. And I asked him the same question. Well, Japan has reports. They even have a, they had a prime minister's wife that went on the record on TV and admitted to being an abductee. Okay. Yeah. So it's known over there. You see it in their culture. Um, they've had conferences there. They got organizations there. Not nearly what you see in the U.S., but Japan has it. And in the U.S., which is full blown off its rocker, everything, everything, aliens, UFOs. So what are we seeing? You see full blown, halfway, and then nothing. What's the relationship? It's all based on time because Korea, they got no time on their hands, but Japan, Korea, Japan's, to, to me, Japan, when I go there, they appear to be like three decades ahead of Korea in time because remember, they came out of World War II, Korea's after in the Korean War. So they developed right. faster and they got to where they were, they got to their advancement a while back and now they're settling in. So they've got some time that they can play and enjoy themselves. So what do they do? They dabble. And then you got the U S it seems like everybody's got time on their hands and they dabble a lot. So, What's my hypothesis? I can put one out there as a researcher because that's what you do. You put out a hypothesis. You do everything you can to prove it wrong. <laughs> and then you try to show it's repeatable. So if I was to take this on, which I just might do one day, I talk about it. Maybe I'll take it on. And, and, and go through the whole motion. Here's the hypothesis. The UFO experience, a sighting or abduction, is based on how much time on your hands you have. 
<laughs> Simple hypothesis there. <laughs> a lot or little. <laughs> and if you got a lot of time on your hands, all right, let's say it's a lot of time on your hands. So if I get all the way to the end and that's what it looks like and, I, and to prove it, and I can prove it, it's got to be repeatable. That's easy. How many people you want to see that are experiencers? I mean, all had time on our hands. They all opened the door. Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about when we say open a door? How, how do you open a door to an alien? Well, this is where it gets interesting. My mentor in this way back when, when I became a believer, was the late Dr. David Allen Lewis who wrote the book, UFO, End Time Delusion. Delusion. You can still get it on Amazon. Some, I don't know if they got new copies, but I know they got used copies. And uh, great book, because when I came to the truth, I thought, oh, there's got to be a Christian book on this. You know, I can't be the only one that knew this. So I went down to the first Christian bookstore I could find, which happened to be a big one in my, my neighbor, neighborhood. And I'm walking around, walking around, walking around. I can't find anything. And uh, I said, well, it's got to be a way to do this. It's got to be like a library. got to have something on the computer you can look up. So I went to the girl at the counter and I said, on your computer here, can you look up by subject or author or whatever to find a book? She says, yeah, either way or publisher. I said, okay, how about subject? She says, uh, yeah, give me a subject. I said, UFOs or aliens? She looked at me and she says, you know you're in a Christian bookstore? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. <laughs> okay, give me just a minute. She looks and sure enough, a couple books show up. Um, one was, well, three of them, actually. One was uh, John Ankerberg, I think, and Zola Levitt, and then Dr. David Allen Lewis. And when I saw his, I thought, hmm, that one I got to grab. So she had to order it. So I got it and it came in. She called me and uh, said, book sent. I came back and got it. And I went, wow, he spells it out. And the only thing missing was evidence. Because I thought it's one thing to tell people what the Bible says this is. It's another thing to show what the Bible tells this is. That's a major difference there. Because especially when you're trying to tell a non-believer what the Bible says. That's why this research is so important. Because I show you what the Bible says. Not just the evidence for. I show you the evidence for what it says, not just what it says. That's important. So I contacted him and I shared with him about these testimonies. Oh, man, was he just excited to no end. Over the next couple of years, I ended up making a couple of trips out there. And actually, he was holding a conference in... Uh, 1999 prophecy prayer and spiritual warfare conference it was huge it was uh four days at uh cornerstone church in springfield biggest names in <laughs> in christianity that i'd ever heard of at the time were there me and my partner he flew us out there to talk you know give a talk we shared the talk we sat there we were talking on friday panel discussion on saturday and we're sitting there, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, listening to the talks. And uh, these were, this was Assembly of God Church. He was part of the Assemblies of God organization. And he was holding the conference, David, Dr. David Allen Lewis was. So here's the international head of the Assemblies of God Church and the number two guy, both had their own talks, right? Both of them 
in their talks, they acknowledged to the people that were there in the conference to make sure they came back on Saturday to listen to them two guys sitting right out there that Dr. David Allen Lewis had invited from Florida. They were going to share some powerful message. And I looked at my partner and I said, is he talking about us? <laughs> These people had been in ministry 40 years themselves. We had never talked in the church. And they're talking about Looking forward to our talk. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the Lord. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was quite an experience. That was the beginning. Yeah. So here we are. 2000. Where are we at? 21. And mm -hmm. things are just exploding. Well, I got to share with the listeners or the watchers of this. Uh, one little problem that's come up over this all, this whole thing that's made this, this is warfare because what we're dealing with here in every sense is a spiritual war. Because remember, back when I told you in the beginning, Ephesians 6, 12, what does it say? Break it down. For we wrestle not, not against, not against flesh and blood. Not against flesh and blood. Okay. So what else is there? Spiritual entities. That's what it tells us. We're warring against a spiritual entity. The same spiritual entity that has been trying to deceive humanity from the all the way back from the garden. Why is he trying to deceive humanity? Because from the garden, he wanted to break that relationship that humanity had with God. He was jealous of God. And then God says, I will put enmity between your seed and thy seed. Okay? My seed and thy seed. Mm. In other words, he's going to fix the problem that he just, that the enemy created with the fall, with deceiving the two creation people that God had a relationship with, that he walked in the garden with. God had a plan. He was going to fix this. And he fixed this with two sons who came along, Cain and Abel. He's going to build this new line of righteous family to come along so that he can have a redeemer come and build that relationship back with this fallen humanity. God's had this plan. He, he could see the whole future of this coming. It says right in his word. But this enemy, he don't want this to happen. So what does he do? He starts muddling up the plan. First instance was with Adam and Eve. Next instance we see of muddling the plan was you see in there where Cain and Abel bring their offering of worship to to God. Right. One brings the meat offering and one brings the plant offering. One was accepted as good, one was accepted as bad. And the enemy got in there and kind of did that. That was he was behind that. We ended up losing the good guy over that. The one that did the right kind of worship by bringing the meat offering. His brother killed him. Well, that line of worship that we just lost there was the one that God had planned that the Redeemer would come from. Mm. So again, the enemy has got into the 
line that the Redeemer is supposed to come from. So God says, okay, you can fix that. I'm in charge. You think you can stop me, but I'm in charge. So what happens next? Seth is born. Seth becomes that righteous line. Right? Yeah. Well. Yep. Seth becomes the righteous line that comes all the way down to where Christ is born. All the way through Noah, through the ark, all the way down. The whole purpose is, is to be able to have a righteous line to Christ. Not a bloodline, but a spiritual righteous line that worships God in the right way. Okay? That's the purpose. It hasn't been about genetics at all. It's never been about pure genetics. It's been about proper worship is what it's about. Hmm. If you go through scripture and you can see the study over and over and over, it's about proper worship. And when you get to the end, you'll see what this is all about. Because when it comes down to the end, what are we told? It's going to be about proper worship. Very the mark of the beast is going to be about worship. Yes. Very true. It's you know that Genesis foretells everything that's to ever happen is right there in that first chapter, that first book. Everything, everything is foretold in Genesis. You'll see it in the end. So if you pervert Genesis, you won't see it in the end. You won't know what to look for. Right. If you don't see Genesis correctly, you won't know what to look for correctly in the end. That makes total sense to me because uh, you have so many different theories uh, and endless genealogies, which we're, you know, told to watch out for uh, in Scripture. Uh, but specifically the serpent seed theory. Yes, but it's not. The seed is not a physical seed. It's a spiritual seed. Totally spiritual. It's the righteous line is what we're to keep. And that righteous line is going to be decided at the mark of the beast. That's where you decide on how you worship, who you choose to worship, and how you worship. It's going to be based on how you worship. The choice is going to be based on how you worship. Okay? Because that beast is, if you look at the the the, uh, the definition of or the characteristics of the beast, what the beast does is it says that he changes God's times and laws. Correct? Right. What time and what laws? And that's where you're going to have to decide how to worship properly. What time and laws were set down in Genesis? Because it's going to be the same ones in the end that the beast is going to pervert. What time was set down is talked about in Genesis? What's the time of a day in Genesis? When does the day start and when does the day end in Genesis? Right. It's usually from what we've been told, right? 24, you look at 24 hours, but a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. No, no. A thousand years. Don't, don't like, go with that. A day is a day in Genesis. But when does the day start? The reason it's not a thousand years because it tells you a day started at sundown. And went mm -hmm. to sun up. That's not a thousand years. That's a day. Okay. So right. It's a it's a six day creation period. Okay. Right. It tells you that. You got to do one heck of a science fiction stretch to get a thousand years out of sun up to sundown. Okay. Sure. So there is your time that was changed. How do we tell time now? When's the day start now? Well, the day starts midnight. Now. Midnight. Yes. Well. 
Jewish, right? We, we go by, uh, if you're going by the Jewish calendar, right, or Jewish day, right, that starts at night, right? So that starts in the evening hour. Yeah. Right? But this is where, remember, this is the beast we're talking about for the end times. The beast is going to be the one that deceives the believers. Okay. So you got to watch for this because everything in Genesis tells us what to watch for. The beast is going to change worship. Okay. It's all about worship. Everything is about worship. That's what the enemy is trying to deceive us with. This is what they deceived us. This is what the whole thing was about with um, Jesus and the Pharisees. This is why they challenged him about set, about what can you heal on the Sabbath? Okay. This was all about the worship. Okay. Everything is about worship. So when it comes to the end, go back to Genesis. That's the foundation. Everything is the attacks have been on the foundation. You attack the foundation, it all crumbles. So it's about worship. First was change the time. Now everybody goes by midnight, starts the new day. Okay. Everybody goes by the same calendar now. Also, what else did they change? God's law. In God's Ten Commandments, which are God's laws, they never changed. What's the fourth commandment? It would be remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Well, that got changed. You know, now they, they changed that. So somebody changed time and law. Okay? Okay. So whoever did that is most likely the beast. Mm. I'll let you look that up. So when the beast decides to make it law that you must worship him, it's going to be on his schedule, not God's. And that's where the choice is going to come in. Are you going to follow God's worship or the beast's worship? Because God never changed his worship schedule. Okay, now let's get back to Genesis, why we're talking about that. Some other things got changed in Genesis too. So this has all been about getting that righteous line to Jesus. Because it's about worship. Okay, it's about a righteous line. Okay, mm. so the big deception that we've been dealing with in this UFO community, and now is actually part of the New Age metaphysical community, right along with it, now that they're exposing themselves to this spiritual aspect of aliens. The Christians believe that aliens, by the Bible, are fallen angels. They're spiritual beings, by technically by what Scripture says. They're not, you know, they're not ETs from another world, okay? I'm good with that. You have the New Age metaphysical realm that are trying to reach some kind of higher advanced spiritual aliens, even though they say there's also physical aliens from other planets. But there's these also higher physical or spiritual aliens that are the, the ones that they want to be in. Those are the good ones, but there's also bad ones. Okay. So they're trying this CE5 thing that they're all about, everybody's talking about to get in contact with them. Might as well grab a Ouija board. It's doing the same thing, but they do it through meditation. Yeah. Okay? So we're still dealing with a spirit. It's a deceiving spirit. Then you got the government coming out and saying that they are been tracking these things with the Navy pilots. And what do these objects do? This tic-tac. OK, if you listen carefully to what they're telling you, these things defy physics. That can't happen. Mm. If it's a physical object in a physical universe, it cannot defy God's laws of physics. What can A spiritual manifestation can, because it ain't from here. It's visiting here. 
in a form of a manifestation. What's a manifestation? It's not a created anything. It's a formed something. Dr. Lewis talks about this in his book. It can appear as something, okay, an object of whatever entity decides it wants it to appear as. It can appear as solid, but it's actually, it takes energy and whatever is around it and causes it to come together to appear. That is a manifestation. We know that manifestations happen. Scripture talks about it, okay? We know that it's, they're being seen, okay? Even the government's now reporting that these things are happening. Sighting reports even talk about these things happening. I've sat in on interviews of people describing a manifestation sighting event. Jenny Randall's English researcher back in the 90s termed this special event the Oz Factor. If you look it up and, and understand what the Oz Factor is, it's when somebody is in close proximity of a UFO sighting event, they will experience time distortion, total silence. It's like they're inside of a bubble. If you look at the classification, the Jack Valet's classification for abduction experience for CE4, you know what it actually says? Reality transformation. Mm. You're getting caught up in the manifestation. You're within the proximity. Wow. Things are distorted. So we're seeing actual manifestations from spiritual entities into our physical plane. Okay? So that backs up and supports that we're dealing with a spiritual entity, not physical ETs. Now, question people are going to say, well, do you think we're alone in the universe with all this big universe? Personal opinion? Yes. Why do I say that? Because God's word backs it up. You don't believe me? Go read it. What does it tell you the universe is for? Signs and wonders and for times and seasons. Okay? That's it. Christ ain't going to go out there and die a million times on a million planets. He made this for us because he loved us right. that much. Amen. He made it that big so that we would be in that much awe of his love for us. Do you understand? You know what the enemy's trying to tell you? That you are that small in a universe that big that you ain't nothing. Which one do you want to be? Mm -hmm. The apple of God's eye or nothing? I think I'd rather be the apple of God's eye. Amen. This is what we're dealing with here. Okay? Now, back to the other part of the deception. Because this deception just runs deep, deep, deep. As I started bringing these lost souls deceived by this spiritual entity with this false memory vision of an abduction experience because they're not being taken anywhere because they're spiritual entities. They're not physical entities. They're not going to a physical craft, okay? But these people think this experience is that real because these entities can give them that real of an experience. Read the visions that God gives these people, these prophets in the Bible. They think it was that real. Okay, so visions can be that real. But they're visions. This craziness shows up in the church. I fell for it. A new teaching was starting to show up. And it exploded. It's right back to the foundation of what the end is going to be. It's back to that same foundation of worship. He says, I've been the one pushing this. You've just been following me as your partner. I said, he says, thank you. We're done with this. <laughs>